So the video clip you just saw is from the movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose, and no, I do not recommend the movie to you. Uh, it's very intense. But I want you to know that it is based on a real story. Uh, the girl's name was not Emily Rose. Her name was Annalise Michelle. It's a young woman who struggled with some level of mental illness, but also apparently struggled with demon, demonization, demon possession of some kind. In the process of attempting her deliverance, a couple of priests and her parents were tried and convicted of neglect because she ended up dying in the process. And that's what the story is about. Now, Annalise's story raises one of the most misunderstood and, frankly, untalked about topics in our faith, and that is the existence of demons and their influence on human beings. What are demons? What do they do? And most importantly, can they hurt me? This is what we want to know. Early in the life of Grace Church, those were exactly my questions, despite the fact that I had a Bible school training and despite the fact that I had been a pastor for a long time, I did not understand, and I avoided the subject. And one day, I could not avoid the subject anymore. I uh, had finished preaching. This was, uh, I think, in the first year of grace, maybe the second year. I'd finished preaching, and I'd stepped down off the platform, and a woman came up to me with another woman in tow. Now, I knew the two of them. I had talked with the older woman because she was mentoring the younger woman, and she, she had told me she thought that this younger woman was struggling from some kind of demonic oppression. And she had told me, we probably need to deal with this sometime. And I'm like, I don't really, A, know how to do that, and I don't really understand the subject. But she brought her up to me, and she looked at me, and she said, we have to do this right now. And when I looked at the young woman, I realized... We probably did because her eyes were rolling up into her head and it was getting weird. So I looked around and I found a prayer warrior and a prayer warrior and a prayer. I said, come with me, come with me, come with me, come with me. And I grabbed a bunch of people and we went into my office and we sat the young lady down and I will spare you the details because you could probably use your imagination and you would probably come with, up with exactly what happened in my office there for an hour to an hour and a half. It was not a pretty picture. Uh, and it was chaotic, and there was noise, and there was yelling, and I was doing the best I could to, with my limited knowledge to cast demons out of this girl. <laughs> well, thankfully, at the end of an hour, an hour and a half, in our ham-fisted approach to this thing, she was delivered, um, at least temporarily. We had to go back and spend more time with her, and hers was a, just a very, very sad story. But after that encounter, I determined that I never wanted to be naive again. I determined I did not want to be unprepared again. And so, for the last 25 years, I have been studying and reading and preparing and praying. And I can tell you that in the last 25 years since then, I've participated in a number, numerous deliverance sessions that were not chaotic. They were ordered and they were under control because they don't have to be chaotic and I've watched many people who were under the influence of dark spiritual forces be set free in the last 25 years friends this is a real thing demons are real things but deliverance from the influence of demons is also a real thing and it is entirely possible and assured through the power of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, deliverance from demonization is one of the evidences or hallmarks of a revival. Where the Holy Spirit is causing spiritual awakening in a community, people are being set free. For example... Acts chapter 5, verse 16, in the middle of one of the greatest, the greatest revival in human history, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, 
and all of them were healed. And then this story from a little bit later on in Acts, one of the leaders of the early church, Philip, goes into Samaria, and it says, with shrieks, evil spirits came out of many. And many paralytics and cripples were healed. And I love this last phrase, so there was great joy in this city. I love that. Of course, if people are being delivered, right? <clears throat> There's a, an author who uh, wrote a book. It's kind of old school. It's been around a while, but still a classic on the subject. Mark Bubeck was the pastor, and Rob Yonan and I actually were, uh, when we first met, we were pastoring at the church that Mark had pastored um, years before. He wrote a book called The Adversary. He said this, A spiritual revival will send the kingdom of darkness into retreat as no other event can. That is why Satan will do everything he can to stop a revival and the declaration of the gospel. This, hey, doesn't this not make a little bit of sense what we're facing today? right now does it not feel like that the possibility that God may be working in powerful ways to release people from the power of the evil one there's a lot of pushback going on in our culture from the evil one do you are you feeling feeling this with me that maybe this is what is happening well if nothing else this morning that's really all I wanted you to know and all I really wanted you to do is pray a little more intently for Revival. Last week, I made it, I think I made it clear. I asked you, it wasn't a rhetorical question, will you join me in praying for revival? Spiritual awakening in our lives and in our community. Pray for conversions, for people to surrender to Jesus. Pray for conviction. I gotta stop here for a second. Uh, I gotta tell you, remember last week I talked about conviction for those of you who are here? And so at the end of the service, I asked you, we asked you if you would like to take a moment and be articulate with Jesus about the thing that is causing you conviction. That you write it down. We have these stations around the auditorium and we, the thing that God's convicting you of, would you write it down on a post-it note and then crumble it up or rip it up and put it in the little garbage can, little trash can. Well, many people did that. I did it all four hours because God can, kept convicting me of things, Right? So I, at uh, any rate, Joanna, who's on our staff here, on uh, Monday or Tuesday was, was cleaning things up. And she went and she was dumping the, the uh, trash cans out. And mostly, all of, almost all of them were ripped up or crumbled up, but one. And in the bottom of one of those trash cans was written this, I am cheating on my spouse. That's pretty straight up to write on a little post-it note and put in a trash can here. Now, I have no idea who you are. I don't know if you're in this service or in one of the other services. But if that's you, may I make an offer to you? May I make a suggestion? If God convicted you of that, I'm glad. But I would encourage you to keep pursuing what God is saying to you. And if you need help extricating yourself from this situation that you find yourself in, would you come see me? Call me, email me, and I would like to meet with you to help you process this if God has brought you to that level of conviction. So we're praying for conversion, praying for conviction. Join me in praying for healing, bodies, minds, and spirits. Would you join me in praying for unity? These are all evidences of revival. Pray that ordinary people, all of us, be empowered with extraordinary ability Would you pray for a a wave of desperate love and sacrificial community to overwhelm us? Would you pray for these things? And let me add to it what we're going to talk about now for the rest of our time. Would you pray for deliverance, for people to be set free from the grips of the adversary? My guess is most of you have never prayed for that. But if we're going to pray for revival, we need to pray for deliverance because people need it. Okay, that's really all I wanted to say this morning. Like, so I'm done. Um... (laughs) However, I'm not really done because now that I've brought this subject up, would you like to get a little primer on this subject? Would, would you like to hear a little bit more about demons and deliverance and all that? Okay, because I'm, I'm going to. So, uh, <clears throat> This is not 401 stuff, uh, friends, so do not get your hopes up that this is going to be in-depth. This is like 101. This is going to be basic information about demons and deliverance that we all need to know. And I'm going to keep it very, very 
Simple. Here's my outline for the rest of the time I'm standing here. Number one, point one, demons are real and active. Right? Real and active. That's point one I'm going to show you from the scriptures when I talk about it. And number two, demons are completely defeatable. That's point two. And you're going to walk out of here with that. That's going to be ringing in your brain. That's what I want you to remember. So grab a Bible. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, page 830. The Bible's on the seat in front of you or grab your uh, app. <clears throat> hey, while you're looking that up, can I add an editorial comment to this business about these two schools that are coming? Like, I live, North India is where I live. This is my, this is my neighborhood, and uh, Penny and I and our kids have lived there for 24 years. And so I have watched that community transform. Um, it was a typical kind of suburban community. Um, it has changed dramatically, so much so that those two schools, Nora School and Greenbrier School, um, those kids now constitute some of the greatest levels of poverty in Indianapolis. I want you to know that the teachers in those schools are heroes of mine. Because their work, and especially in Nora School, uh, I, was it 27 different languages are spoken by the kids? These, a lot of these kids have just immigrated to, to the United States. And I want to tell you that God has opened a way into their lives through a show. And I am praying, along with Amy and her team, that something miraculous is going to come out of this. God is working, and thank you for being a part of that. This is spectacular. Okay. Here we go. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, Paul says to the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's a key verse, everybody. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Verse 13. Therefore... Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil does come, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. So stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with us in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Now, I'm going to start in there. I'm going to leave there. I'm going to come back there. So keep the Bible on your lap and we'll eventually end up there. But let's focus in on verse 12, okay? Let's just pay attention to verse 12. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against this list of things, rulers, authorities, powers, and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Let's take that first phrase, in the, or that last phrase, in the heavenly realms. All right, um, that phrase does not mean the stars, the moon, galaxies. It doesn't mean outer space. So when you think heavenly realms, don't think the stuff that's out beyond the planet. The phrase means the unseen world that exists right here, right around us, every day, all the time. There is an unseen world. I mean, I, you can see, we, you can touch the person beside. There is a physical world. And so we need to get this through our heads. There's also an unseen world around us. And in that unseen world are creatures. I don't know what else to call them. We'll, we'll see in a minute that they're really angels, fallen angels. And uh, he, uh, Paul says, this struggle, these, pe these things are not flesh and blood. They are invisible. So all around us, in the unseen world around us, all the time exists invisible beings. And apparently they're very ordered because uh, Paul describes them as rulers. They seem to be the big cats, authorities and powers and spiritual forces. So they're like an army. And in verse, right at the beginning of the verse, he says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It, 
But our struggles against these invisible beings, the word struggle here means contest or wrestling match. So right off the bat, here's what we pick up. We pick up that there are invisible beings around us that we are in a struggle with on an ongoing basis. They're in the unseen world. We can't see them. And we're wrestling against them. Now, keep your Bibles open. We're going to come back to Ephesians 6 in a minute. But let me go a little deeper in a description of these beings. The last book of the Bible is the book of Revelation. And what it is was a revelation that a guy named John received, a vision he received. And part of the vision he received, he saw a battle between angels that apparently happened a long time ago before human beings came to exist. Eternity passed. So apparently these angels were created beings, and for some reason, they get after each other. They're going after it, and on one hand are some angels under the leadership of a big angel, some powerful angel named Michael, and there's a group of angels who decided to align with an equally powerful angel, because Satan is an angel, and in, well, let me read to you what happened. Here's what John said, and the dragon lost the battle, And he and his angels were forced out of heaven. And this great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one who deceives the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. So let's get this this straight. There are angels in the unseen world, good ones and bad ones. And they're created beings. And the the bad ones, they lost the battle. And it says they're thrown down to the earth. So somehow these demons, along with Satan, were cast out of the presence of God. And they were sent. This became their outpost. They are sent to this planet. Thank you very much. (laughs) This is where they exist. And we wrestle with them. Demons are angels. This is their outpost. So now what do they do? Now, we don't have time to unpack or read the many, and there are many stories in the scriptures of people who are delivered from demons, and you can get a picture of what they do, and I've got to be honest, this is where it gets a little bit complicated, and I don't have the time to examine what this harassment looks like, this struggle we have. But let me just, let me just say that the harassment that they can bring into your life, into my life, can sometimes look like mental problems sometimes it can look like physical distress but i want you to know that their biggest weapon in the hands of a demon the biggest weapon is a lie just like with satan they cause confusion now sometimes what they can do and you'll see why they're able to do this in a minute but uh, sometimes they can, they can see and perceive a weakness that you have, maybe a wedge into your life, and they can shoot that gap, and with their lie and with their confusion, they can take that and make it a big thing. This is what happens many times. Um, something that started off as a bad experience or, or, a, or a bad decision can be wedged into make, by demons and made much worse. They can actually, I don't, I don't totally understand how this works, but, but according to the scriptures, they can also find a way to impact us physically, which I don't totally get all that. So, so um, but here's the thing. So this is what they do. Now, I want to make it clear about one thing in particular. Can a person be possessed? Well, the answer is yes and no. Let me explain. Interestingly, There's no Greek word that is interpreted in the New Testament for possession. Now, you could say, what says right here in my Bible? Possession. Well, that's when a person was interpreting the Greek, that's the word they chose because it made the most sense, but that's not literally what it says. Every time somebody, it says possess, here's what it literally says. They had a demon. They had a demon. Now, they, somebody chose to interpret that as possessed or oppressed, but it literally is had a demon. That's why I don't like to use the word possessed or oppressed. That's why you'll hear me use the word demonization. That's sort of a word we've made up to describe. What it, so let me try to explain it to you, what it means to have a demon. If you came to me and you said, I have an infection, 
okay? Cold, flu, something worse. You said, you said, you, you can't even say, I had an infection. It could mean on one end of the scale that you have the sniffles, right? On a scale of one to 10, if you had an infection, a one would be, I'm all right, but I got the sniffles. On the other hand, I've been in the ICU unit when somebody's had an infection and they're near death. That's a 10 on a scale of one to 10. So in the same way that you can have an infection, you can have a demon. Meaning, just about every day, because there are so many of them in the unseen world, we all experience a little bit of demonization when we're tempted to do something or think something. That's like a one or two on a scale of one to 10. Now you can deal with that and I can deal with that fairly easily by saying, no, I'm not gonna go there or pray God help me here and it's dealt with, okay? But there are other people that after a period of years of constantly listening to the lie, which started off small, they're now finding themselves on a scale of one to 10 at an eight, nine, or 10, and that's when it starts to sound like, feel like possession. Do, do you see what, what the, the scale of one to 10? And when it gets to that point, there's some serious prayer that has to go on for that person to be delivered, but even a person on a scale of one to 10 that is a 10, they can be delivered because of the power of Jesus Christ. Do not forget that. So if you're a 10, and by the way, if you are a 10, and there are people, I've had this, peop- this weekend, there have been people in the service that are, have had significant levels of demonic activity in their life, and we've had to pray over them. You Right now, you're really uncomfortable, and I know you are, because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. But you can be delivered, my friend, because greater is he that is in us that is in than he that is in this unseen world. So, they are real. They can affect us, some of us quite intensely. But let me dispel some rumors about demons. Number one, they are not omniscient. They do not know everything, nor can they read your mind. So don't think that there's an evil spirit out there that can read your mind. They cannot read your mind. They're created beings. They are not omniscient. Now, I want to point out something. They are timeless. They live outside of the physical time that you and I live in. They were created before the earth was created. So they live in this unseen world where there's no time. This is why it appears that they're that they know more than they do. They just see everything from past to future. They're not omniscient. They can't read your mind, but they can see what's coming down. Does this make sense to you? So they are not omniscient. The second thing I want you to know is this. They are not omnipresent. They cannot be everywhere. They can only be in one place at one time. Now wait for the shocker, including Satan. He can only be in one place. I don't know where he is right now. But he can only be in one place in this world at one time because he's a created being. Now, then you might look at me and say, well, why is there so much evil in this world? Because there are a lot of henchmen out there, rulers, authorities. He's got a lot of... Does this make sense to you? Everybody, you still tracking with me here? So they are not omniscient and they are not omnipresent. And above all, they are not omnipotent. All right? They are not all powerful. Demons can be dealt with. They are easily defeatable. I don't care what you're facing in the way of temptation. I don't care what level on a scale of 1 to 10 you are in in, in this infection, this evil infection. It is is defeatable. So that's the second part of my message. So let's move into that. Demons are defeatable let me show you how defeatable they are. I'm going to tell you a story. Um, from, the, from the book of Acts, the apostle Paul and his friends were in a town and they were preaching and they're doing their thing. And this strange girl, who apparently had a demon, young girl, keeps following them around and saying kinds of weird things. Oh, and it actually doesn't sound like bad things. Oh, these are servants of the most high. And he was just getting annoying to Paul. Completely annoying. He let it go on for a couple of days until one day he had enough 
And Paul became so troubled, it says, that he turned around and he said to the Spirit directly, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. At that moment. He didn't have to invoke some kind of long, drawn-out thing. He just said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you. Now, I want you to get that in your head. And I want you to repeat after me. I will say a phrase. You repeat it after me. Everybody, here we go. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you. Let's put it all together. Say one, two, three. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you. Now I want you to add an actual physical thing with your hand. It's going to go like this. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you. Okay? Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you. You can do this any time you sense you're under some level of oppression. Can I just make sure you're with me on this? It's pretty simple. Ready? One, two, three. Do it again. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you. I don't care if you're walking along and you feel a sense of oppression come over you and darkness come over you. What do you say? In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you. And then you can command it. Go away. Leave me alone. What I normally like to say in this situation, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to go where Jesus is sending you. Because Jesus will join you in this command and he'll take it from there and send them where he wants to send them. Are you with me? In the name of Jesus Christ. A couple of weeks ago, I woke up in the middle of the night. I had to use the bathroom. I'm 61 years old, okay? So <laughs> this happens to us. But on, in, when I walk into the bathroom, wow, there was a presence. Have, any, have you ever felt something like there was a darkness in the room and I could actually... And what did I do? I didn't want to wake up my wife, but I said it quietly. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. Guess what it did? It left. Why? Because it has to. Because, and by the way, it's, and you're looking at me going, that's because you're a pastor. Wrong? No. It's not because I've got some kind of serious mojo going on here. That's not what's going on here. Anybody who's indwelt by the presence of the Holy Spirit has the authority to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave, to go away, to leave us alone. You have children. Do your children struggle with dreams at night? Are they not able to sleep? Do you sense that they're troubled when they go to bed? When you put them to bed, kneel down beside them. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave my child alone and leave this place. It works because they have... If you are struggling, you've struggled... With, for, with, with some kind of thing for years. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. Are you with me? You have the authority and you have the power as a child of God. Um, but I want you to gear up for this. Oh, it, before I move on, I need to say this. If you're a child of God and you have the Holy Spirit living within you, you can say in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave, I command you to go, I command you to leave this house. If you're not a follower of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is not, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, don't try this at home. It will not go well for you if you're dealing with dark forces and you are not surrendered to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit does not live within you because you do not possess the authority to get rid of them. So my friend, I recommend that step one is for you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You know this. We've talked about this often. When you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. You are now a child of God. You are possessed by the presence of God. And now you have the authority to say in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. Also, the rest of us, it probably be a good idea for us to work on our spiritual lives and walking in the spirit. It certainly helps if you're going to deal with demonic forces. So one last time, can you go back to Ephesians 6 with me? You still have your Bibles open? Ephesians 6, we'll only take a minute, and then I'm going to wrap this up. Finally, be strong in the Lord. See, you need to get strong in the Lord. Right now, some of you are kind of weak in the Lord. 
You need to be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you could take your stand against the devil's schemes. And I'm not going to read the rest of this, but basically it's like, okay, put on this helmet of salvation, put on the belt of truth. There are people I know, they've told me this, they get up in the morning, they actually look in a mirror and they go like this. They actually do this because it's a way that in their mind they're getting prepared for the day. They're getting strong in the Lord. And so they're, they, before they, they, they pr- pretend picking up the shield and they pretend picking up the sword and they got the helmet on and they got the, she- they got the breastplate on and they got the shoes with the piece and the stuff and they are ready to go into the world. Now, I'm not suggesting, if that works for you, bravo. Do what you need to do. You know it's a metaphor, right? You know what it's saying is, be strong in the Lord. Can I say it the way we've been talking about the last three, last three or four months? It is time for you to start walking in the Spirit. Now, if you don't know what that means, go back to the sermons that we preached in July and August and re-listen to what it means to be baptized in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. Be prepared, be strong in the Lord. And finally, verse 18, Paul makes a big deal about prayer. He says, and pray in the Spirit on how many occasions? All. With how many kinds of prayers? And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for how many of these saints? All of them. Pray like mad. So assuming you're prepared and you're praying, let's get specific about what you need to do. I've already already done this. I'm not going to repeat it. If you sense that you or a loved one is being harassed or your struggle is against these invisible forces, which are real, Just remember, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to go where Jesus is sending you. Go away. Leave. And Jesus, come out of her. Come out of me. And they will. And they will. There's an interesting story about Jesus' life. People were so amazed, it says in Mark chapter 1, they they were asking each other, "What what is this? What kind of teaching is this? I mean, he orders evil spirits to come out of people and they obey him. What kind of teaching is this? Do you realize the same is true of you? Jesus took the authority that was his and he said, I'm now giving it to you through the presence of the spirit. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. I'm giving you authority. Mark Bubeck says it this way. The authority of which we are speaking is the portion of every believer. It is the inherent right of the child of God because of his elevation with Christ to the right hand of the Father. And that's just kind of an evangelical fancy way of saying you have the power over evil spiritual forces around you. Why? Because the weapons you fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Demons are real, and they harass us, and we can get an infection of them, but they are defeatable, my friends, in your life and in the lives of the people around you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to go, and they will. Can I pray for you? Let's pray. So I'm quite certain there there are people sitting in this room right now that are torn. Uh, On one hand, um, they're probably struggling. They've struggled so long with this that they can't see a way out. On the other hand, they're just crying out, please, may I be free. I pray that you give them courage. Give them life. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to stop, stop right now. I'm just going to pray this prayer. Um, in this room, I am sure there are people that are being harassed right now. So I'm going to, all the evil forces in this world or spirits or demons that are in this room, you will come to attention right now. You will come to attention. I'm speaking to you. You hear me. And I'm going to tell you in Jesus' name, you are to release that person. You are to release this person who is struggling. In Jesus' name, I I command you to go where Jesus is sending you. You will release them now and they will taste freedom for the first time in a long time. You will go. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that this is true. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have filled us with your spirit so that we have power. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that we are your children. And as your children, you've given us this authority. And I pray these things through Jesus' holy name. Amen.